Welcome to the DJE Podcast, where you will learn about real estate investing from real life examples. Here's your host, Devin Elder. Okay, today on the show, we have Mr. Glenn Gonzalez. Really glad to have him on board for this podcast. Excited to dive in. He started as a maintenance man in multifamily and is now a multi-millionaire right? Great transition and a great story. Uh, He's owned and operated uh, 5,000 apartment units. Uh, Glenn is author and best selling uh, uh, Amazon bestseller of the book Maintenance Man to Millionaire, also the CEO of Obsidian Capital Co. Without any further ado, Glenn, how are you? Good, Devin. Thanks for uh, having me on the show. I'm pretty excited about this. Yeah, awesome. Really glad to have you on too and kind of dig in on, on what you guys are up to these days. If, um, if somebody's not familiar with you or your book or mm-hmm. connected with Obsidian Capital, maybe give us just kind of a, a, an overview. How, I mean, maintenance man, maintenance man to millionaire, love the story, want to <laughs> dig in, but, but ha- you know, p- paint a little bit of a picture for us on, on how you sure. got into the sure. kind of the ownership side. You bet. You know, the, the book came about because I shared this story that I'm going to share with you right now. And uh, several people kind of just said, dude, you got to share that with, you got to write it. You got to write a book. And I'm like, no, there's no way I'm going to do that. You know, it's not on my bucket <laughs> list. Uh, I don't have time. I'm too busy putting deals together, but over and over I'd go to conferences and, and, and I would share how I just kind of started as the industry uh, kind of as a maintenance guy. I was going to college full time and needed some work. So I was working for the Marriott Corporation uh, as a waiter while I was going to school. Uh, At the time, my wife then was um, a leasing consultant and she called and was like, they're really behind on maintenance. Do you want to come and help kind of part-time? And I'm like, sure, I can do that. And it was great for me to earn some extra money. I started painting apartments and fixing toilets and picking up trash and, and it was really cold outside. You know, we had to put down ice melt on the stairs and you know we had to clear the sidewalks from snow and and the whole time I'm listening I'm watching them the leasing agent the assistant manager they're inside where it's warm right they're just (laughs) talking on the phone they're leasing apartments they bundle up and go on a tour they make commissions and I'm like man I want that job how do I get that job you know so finally (laughs) the regional manager was visiting the property uh one time and uh and she you know I said hey uh I'm Glenn. She's like, how are you? You know, good job. Grounds look good. Uh, I said, I want to be a manager someday. And she's like, wait, aren't you the maintenance guy? I'm like, yeah, I'm the maintenance guy. So she's like, all right, go back to work and keep being a maintenance guy. I'm like, all right. So, <laughs> but just the fact that I planted that little seed kind of opened a door because, uh, I don't know, a little, little further down the road, they finally came back to me like, hey, uh, you mentioned you want to be a manager, right? And I'm like, yep. And they're like, well, you might not like this, but we have a small 60 unit apartment complex and it can't really afford a full-time manager or a full-time maintenance for that matter. How would you like to do both? Okay. I'm like, yeah. I'm like, sign me up. I'll do it. You know? Yeah. And, uh, and it was really struggling. I think at the time it had 50, 60% occupancy and there were all these units wow. that needed to be made ready. And, um, and so I jumped in there and started doing the maintenance and managed and leased it up. And, and that really opened the door for me. Uh, because later on, uh, they asked my opinion on a, on a property that was struggling. It was a 300 unit deal. And, and I went and visited that property and said, uh, reported back to my boss. And I said that the, the property manager was just too close to the leasing agent, the leasing agent, and then we're best friends. But uh, I said, mm. at the end of the day, she's not a very good leasing agent and the manager doesn't want to make a change. So the manager finally opened her eyes. I said, Hey, look, if, if, if you can't get rid of her, they're going to get rid of both of you. And yep. so she realized that and made the change and then leasing then improved. And they're like, Glenn, that good call on that. You know? Yeah. Do you want to oversee some other properties? I'm like, yeah. Well, then I graduated college and I was supposed to be a hospital administrator and I did an internship for a hospital and decided I did not want to do hospital administration for the rest of my life. Well, it took me six years to get a four-year degree, and now at the end of that road, I didn't want to do what I went to school to do, so I'm like, now sure. what? So right. why don't we make property management my career? So I uh, got my CPM designation, got my real estate license, uh, started managing, became a regional manager, then eventually became the director of operations for a small company, and I was the number two guy. There was the owner and me, and, uh, and then he fired me. And I'm like, dude, you're firing me. Am I doing that bad of a job? He's like, well, 
I'm really just holding you back from, from your potential. He's like, we're a small company. And he's like, I see you great things, but you, you need to go spread your wings. I'm like, so you're firing me. Wow. (laughs) He's like, yeah, but he was right because then I left and went to a bigger company that was twice the size. And I learned uh, how to oversee tax credit properties and new construction. And that was great. And then eventually a headhunter reached out to me and I, and I got recruited and by equity residential and went out to the West coast in Seattle uh, where I met my first mentor, you know, John Gibson. And he sold me my for, first 44 unit apartment complex. And right. that was exciting. You know, am yeah. I rambling too much here? I don't know if you want to I love it, man. Or... I, I, there's so <laughs> much stuff here. I, I don't want to interrupt you. Okay. I love this story. There's so much I want to dig in on. Um, and, but I don't want to stop you now. You know, yeah. This is great, man. I love well, it. Let, let me share you this. So with John, I, you know, he and I both sat on the apartment association, you know, we volunteer our time. And yep. so and what I, market was this in now, Glenn? It was, in, gone, Seattle, gone, it was in Seattle, it was in Seattle, Washington. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I was a regional manager. Uh, I had a portfolio, you know, I think our area was 10,000 units and there was a couple, there was a few of us regional managers that oversaw the whole portfolio. So part of the time I was down Tacoma, part of the time I was downtown Seattle, which, you know, which is really fun. And other parts yeah. I was in some of the, uh, you know, suburbs, Kent and Auburn and stuff. So anyway, I was kind of all over with equity residential and met John and said, Hey John, I know you own a lot of apartment complexes. And he's like, yeah, I do. And I said, I want to get your opinion. I want to buy one someday. So I said, I'm looking at this little 60 unit deal. Can you take a look at it? And he's like, yeah, you'd probably do all right. And he goes, I got a better deal for you. I'm like, what, what do you have? He's like, I got this little 44 unit deal in Puyallup, Washington. I'm like Puyallup, that's weird. Okay, I'll go look at it. So sure enough, this guy that was a very, very successful multimillionaire, built brand new class A stuff, had totally neglected this little 44 unit deal. I mean, oh wow, it was totally neglected. And he hadn't been there in years. So I said, dude, what's wrong with this property? He was like, I just want to get rid of it. And I'm like, I'll buy it. He's like, I'll sell it. So we shook hands. And then we eventually did a purchase sale contract. He, he was going to carry a note back. But he's like, you need to come up with $150,000 down payment. And I'm like, you know, here I am living paycheck to paycheck with five kids and um, wow. in, a, in a very expensive market. I don't have $150,000 in my checking account. Um, so I went to two friends, my boss and a vendor that we used, uh, you know, uh, all the time. And I said, hey, you guys want to go in on property with me? Great upside. You know, we could be a third, a third, a third. I just need each one of you to put up $75,000 because we need 150. And they're like, wait, wait, are we a third, a third, a third? I'm like, yep, third, a third, a third. And like, but if we put up 75 each, that's all the equity. What are you putting in? I'm like, nothing. And they're like, well, how does that work? <laughs> right? I'm like, well, yeah. I, I found the deal. It's a good deal. And the, and, and the guy's going to carry a note back. And, and I'm like, you guys get paid before I get paid. So it'll all work out. Love and, it. you know, we were close enough friends. We're like, okay, let's do it. And if my boss said it was a good deal, you know, and she was smarter than I am, it must have been a good deal. Well, we eventually managed that property and turned it around, got it stabilized. And we sold it probably 18 months later for about a million dollars more than we paid for it. Wow. Quick turn on that. Yeah, that's awesome. Months, right. So, yeah. um, you know, and, and the mistake I made is we took part of that million and we carried a note back to the new buyer for a half right. a million. And then we put the other half a million in our pocket. Well, you think about the return on that, right? I mean, you put a half million dollars in your pocket off a $150,000 investment. That's not a bad first deal. No doubt. And I'm like, I'm hooked. I'm hooked. I said, the money is in buying these things uh, and selling them for a profit, not necessarily being a property manager. I stayed in property management. I stayed in property management for 25, 30 years and owned my, and operated my own property management company eventually. You know, so, you know, I think all the experience came is um, managing for other people. And it was really a motivator, Devin. Um, the owners that I managed for were very happy with my services. Matter of fact, if I was a good operator, they eventually sold their properties for a profit. Right. They got a big old fat check and I got a big old pat on the back. Hey, good job, Glenn. Thank you very much. That's you right. did great. We made millions. I'm like, fantastic. Now I got to go find some <laughs> other property to manage, right? So, yep. 
Uh, I always kind of knew in the back of my head that's that's the smart ones are the ones putting the deals together and owning them. So, and I just got really good at managing them. So that's an introduction, right? Right there's an introduction on how I kind of started in the industry from maintenance man to, you know, um, to where we are today. So love it, love it. There's there's so much in there that I that I love, and I, one of the things that stands out to me. Lots of questions that I have here, but. <clears throat> you know, the seed was planted early in, in, you know, in your mind to kind of become an owner at some point and, and get on that side. Um, what, what did it take kind of internally for the tipping point? Cause I, I see that a lot of people, there's kind of a jumping off point where yeah. you're taking some risk and that's probably where most people stop and never get to the other side of that. Right. Clearly you yeah. put that deal together with two partners. You didn't have the capital. That's really intimidating. Mm -hmm. um, but you did it anyway. What helped you make that leap over? Cause that's kind of the, that's kind of the difference between people that own thousands of units and people that just maybe have a job, right. Is, is yeah. that jumping off point. Yeah. Yeah. And once you go through that jumping off point, um, things kind of tend to tend to take on a life of their own. So yeah. t talk to me about that, that process. That's a great question, Devin. And let me share with you some experiences that I had. I was one of those W2 employees for years, right? I worked sure. for a man. I worked for a, equity was a very big company and I learned a lot. Um, and a lot of people are in the same boat. They want to move from a W2 into their own, you know, their own space, doing their own stuff and putting together their own deals. I believe this is just my personal opinion some people are born with that and it is in the back of their mind all the time. Yeah. And let me give you one example. Do you remember I told you that I was working uh, as a, as a waiter for the Marriott corporation? Sure. <clears throat> the hotel kind of announced to all the employees, Hey, we're going to upgrade our TVs in the rooms from these older TVs to these, you know, new flat screens. And we're going to make available to all the employees, you know, a 21 inch color TV for 40 bucks. And for any of you that want to buy one, and I'm like, I'll take a hundred. My boss is like, what? I'm like, I want a hundred of those TVs. And the boss is like, what do you do with a hundred TVs? I said, you're selling to me for 40 bucks. I can sell them for 80 bucks. Right. You know, I'm a call, I'm a starving college student. So uh, I did, I found a way and I had, it drove my wife nuts, right? I had, I had boxes of TV, used TVs all over my house. You know, if you think of a hundred boxes those are and they're not flat anymore right these are back when they were right. big <laughs> <laughs> but you know i doubled my money you know and that paid my rent and it helped pay for food for a little while and then there was another experience that i had i went shopping for a used car with my buddies and we found this guy that wanted to sell a little volkswagen um i think i think it was a volkswagen kit car like a volkswagen thing uh and we drove it down main street and we asked all these used dealers, how much you would give us for this car? Like, oh, we'll give right. you $900. I'm like, all right. And, and we went back to the guy that was selling. I said, we'll give you 600. He's like, no, I want 900. I'm like, I'll give you 600 cash today. So we gave him $600 cash, drove it down the street and sold it to the dealer that offered us nine. And I made $300 you know, that afternoon. The reason I share those two experiences with you, Devin, is because sometimes people are just wired. I need to go do a deal somehow. Yep. And um, there's this threshold between I've got to provide for my family and I need a consistent paycheck, which was me, right? I didn't, my family didn't have money. I didn't come from opportunity. Uh, you know, I had to work my way through college, <laughs> selling used TVs, if you could, or, you know, flipping cars. I don't know, whatever, whatever right. I could do to make a buck. And I, and I did. So to answer your question, I think that some people, if they think that way at night and they know who they are, they're your listeners. If they're staying awake at night, trying to figure out how to do their own deal, chances are they're probably going to be successful. And then we should probably talk to them one-on-one -on -one and, and coach them through that. Um, then there's the other people that really want to do that, but they just can't give up that regular paycheck. And the thought of running their own company probably makes them sick to their stomach. So like, right. uh, I, I, I see that in the distance. I want that, but they're, you know, it ain't for me. And they're right. They're absolutely right. I've seen people jump in and put deals together that have gone completely south right? because of the stress. I have a friend of mine that did one, one deal. It was 184 units and he will never do another deal. He went from the single family where he was making a killing and uh, wanted to jump into multifamily and it just, the stress ate him up and the decisions 
it took them too long to make business decisions. And in, in the multifamily world, you, you can't stutter. I mean, you, you got to go for it. You got to make a decision, good or bad. Um, indecision will kill a deal. So anyway, there's my thought on that. You know, how do you transition? You know, you take a little risk. You raise some money from investors. Uh, the very the very first deal that I did that was legit, not with my friends and not 44, it was 200 units. It was in San Antonio, Texas, right? And at that point, I had made the decision, let's go buy this apartment complex, lined up the note, and the lender said, you need a million bucks. Well, the million bucks to me today was no different than the 150 was <laughs> back when I was, you know, uh, transitioned out of the maintenance guy as I was working for, you know, in Seattle, Washington. I didn't have a million dollars and, but this was a legit syndication. I mean, I had to go talk, I had to get 10, 12 people in, in this deal. But Devin, the hard part is everybody asked me like, how many of these deals have you done before where you've syndicated this? And I'm like, this is my first, like, uh, we'll pass. So nine out of 10 people told me they'd pass. Sure. You know, for every no, those, those no's that I got, I'm like, well, do you know somebody that might, you know, they're like, yeah, you might call so-and-so. Well, the, the people that ended up putting the money in that deal um, was none of my contacts or anybody I knew. It all no came kidding. from a referral of a referral yep. of a referral because everybody right. kept all the, all my immediate contacts kept telling me no, right. but they were nice enough to refer me to somebody else. And that's where the money came from. Dude, that deal was a 48% return uh, to the investors. We sold that deal exactly in one year from the right. time we bought it the time we sold it because we had created so much value, turned that thing around. Uh, the bank was getting ready to foreclose on it when they called me and said, as a property manager, do you want to property manage it? And a friend of mine that already was buying properties, he passed on it. So it hit my desk as a potential property management play. And they asked me, what will it take to turn this deal around? And I told them, you need a million bucks to fix all this broken stuff. Sure. And they're like, well, we're not investors. We're a bank. We're going to foreclose anyways. So, well, if you foreclose and wipe out the second and third, I'll come up with a million bucks. And that was my big, bold move, right? I didn't have a million bucks, but I knew that if there was a million bucks dumped into the deal, that property would be successful. I'd been turned around troubled properties for a long time as a property manager. So I had experience. And I kind of talk about that in my book, um, actually, a lot. I talk about the value of you and what you bring to the table as an individual how to perfect your craft. I talk about the successes and the failures. I talk about all the mistakes I made. I talked about how to find good partners or bad partners in the book. Um, and at the end of each chapter is a Glennism. <laughs> so there's, there's little Love it. Glennisms and places to take notes. So it, there's, there's lots of little nuggets in the book that uh, hopefully people draw um, out of, so. That's great. I, I love that. Um, you, so you really were able to leverage a lot of hard, years of hard work with no equity, but that did translate into confidence, right? At some point, yeah. when you go look at this property, you go, I know exactly what to do here. And yeah. somebody with a million dollars cash and no experience in multifamily is not going to see that. They're not going to have that confidence, right? right. So, and, so you're and able Devin, to- And Devin, I also had contractors in relationships with where, just like huge. you said- dude, this thing, Glenn, you see a problem there. I'm like, I know how to fix that problem because I've done it before for other people. But I also had people that, you know, resources and contractors and painters and plumbers, you know, that I've been working with. So that helped. So I had experience. Right. I had the know-how. I had the confidence. I just didn't have any freaking money. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, the end of the day, I had no right. money. I was so poor. Uh, so <laughs> That's what I love about your story is, is you're able to – springboard into deals because of the experience, right? And the operations, can't, I mean, you cannot overstate the importance of operations. You can't just go buy a deal with money and have it work. Yeah. I mean, the money's yeah. got to be there. It's a necessary component of a deal, but the money doesn't have any intelligence. Yeah. There's yeah. so much on the operation side that's got to happen for a deal to work and get a 48% return, right? That just doesn't right. happen by accident. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You know, I had a friend call me, uh, Devin, just a week ago and said, hey, will you look at my deal? I got 100 units and it's not going well. And uh, I said, what's going on? And the, this person sent me all their you know, purchase, the operating agreement, the renovation, the rents that they're trying to get. I dove into all this stuff and I said, I need to go see the property. So I went to the property 
And you know what I found is three things. One, the contractor wasn't getting the units done per the scope of work. And she had no, and this, you know, the owner had no product to lease. The yep. leasing agent couldn't rent. So there's your first problem. And the contractor was slowing down because uh, they hadn't prepared and submitted a draw, you know, for the lender to pull the yeah. money out to pay the contractor. So contractor's so they, not getting paid. Yep. Imagine that. And they're yep. not delivering to the leasing agent. So she's not leasing. And, uh, and the owner didn't know how to really step in and make sure the draw got funded. Right. So, right. because they'd never done it before. Uh, and the process a, is tough. Yeah. It, you, you just got to do it per the lender's um, demands. And if you have a relationship with the lender, which we had a relationship with her lender, we knew them. Uh, I said, we could probably help you with that. The other thing I found that when they came up with their underwriting model, they wanted to get $150 rent bumps in a market that would not sustain that. They were comping to, gosh, they had a C property that was going to be at best a, a B minus, you know, mm-hmm. they were comping mm-hmm. to B plus stuff that were not even in the geographical area. It was a similar product oh, wow. in a nicer neighborhood. So they didn't account for, you know, the actual neighborhood and um, who the demographic was. Right. And I'm like, well, there's your other mistake, you know? Um, yeah. And then the third thing is I said, how much did you purchase this for? And what they paid for it is probably what I would have sold it for after I renovated it. Wow. So they paid too much front. So then I right. finally had to tell the owner, I said, look, uh, you're a dear friend, but truth be told, um, you didn't underwrite it, right? you're not really directing the asset the way it should be directed. And then you pay too much. And, and here's my point, Devin is, is you can't really, really property manage your way out of a bad purchase. I mean, you can go from property management company to yep. property management company to property management company. If and you pay that too all the much, time. Yeah. If you yep. paid too much for that deal and, and they're not getting the rents, you got to look in the mirror. Whose fault is that? Mm-hmm. Yep. Now, with that said, there are good operating companies and there are also bad property management companies. So you've got to know the difference as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a, there's a lot that can be overcome over time with appreciation and some rent growth. But, uh, you know, you're a, a bad basis and a bad purchase price is real tough to overcome. Yeah. Yeah. Real tough to overcome. So, well, yeah. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Um, so tell me about um, kind of what you guys are up to today with Obsidian Capital. You know what what what's going on in 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 you know twenty twenty right now for you guys. What you're working on, what you're buying, what you're selling. Uh, yeah. you know, and what that looks like. So um, currently, we have two hundred and thirty two units under contract. It happens to be in Michigan, uh, which is in Tupin's you know old stomping ground. Yep. Uh, David Tupin, Tupin by the is, way. Uh, yeah. okay. David Tupin yeah, is my business partner. Um, yep. And he, uh, he, under, uh, he undergoes all the underwriting um, acquisitions yep. for us and stuff. So, um, and then, gosh, uh, eight or nine months ago, um, a broker friend of mine called and says, I got three deals that I'm looking to sell. And the owner only wants to show it to four or five people. And right. Glenn, you're one of, you're one of my you know, closest friends and, and buyers. So I'm going to put these deals in front of you. And we ended up buying Cobble Hill up in Fort Worth, 136 units. Awesome. Um, and we syndicated that deal and raised all the money kind of in-house. So uh, David and I worked the phones and raised the money and it's doing fantastic. Between that time and, and today, we've probably underwritten hundreds of deals. We've put in multiple, multiple offers that have never come close to winning. I mean, sure. people are out business by two, three million dollars at a time. Yep. Um, and we're, we're really leveraging the, you know, the low interest rates and the compressed cap rates. Uh, but we're also adjusting for taxes and even more and more for insurance, you know, for people that are in the business. I mean, our insurance went from $250 a door. Uh, some of them are pushing 450 a door. Yep. I mean, they're almost it's amazing. Um, yeah. It's, huge and, and it's not gonna, it's not gonna go back anytime soon. So, you know, because of that, we're, we're underwriting to those figures and, really it's just killing the NOI and the values and other people that are not underwriting to that are just winning the deals. So, and I also Jerry. believe that in our market, you know, we've pushed the rents. We've been pushing the rents pretty high. I would say for like the last seven or eight years. Right. I mean, we're renovating, not just we as a company, but we as this entire market are jumping in and we're renovating properties and we are pushing the rents. And we've done that so much across the board with so many properties how much more is there left to push 
before the residents like I'm not paying that right. or I can't afford to pay that right and I and I believe that we're we're close to that or with the top no but we're we're pretty close so with that said um, you know I'm just going to throw out some numbers we could look at a 80s or 90s deal that might run us 120 a door um, here in the Austin area and other areas uh, and then we would have to sell that same product, you know, for 145 or 150 a door after we do a renovation, push the rents. Well, we've come across uh, three land plays where the owners already have multifamily properties. And they said, will you partner with us? And we said, yes. Yeah. So they contribute the land. We have a partner that's going to build for cost. And we can now build a, you know, a community at $125,000 a door uh, for brand new product coming out of the ground. Right. Right. And that would be less than the A plus properties in rent, you know, two hundred dollars below. Sure. And uh and it's basically what I'm paying other people are paying for nineteen eighties, seventies, you know, product where they're not getting the same rents I'm getting. So if that's where you're at, why don't you know, why don't you just build it instead of buying an old stuff? So we have three deals kind of in the hopper right now, all new development, all ground up. We're not developers. We're not experts in that field. What we are are experts in the numbers, the rents, the um, what we can manage the product for. And we've partnered with two different construction companies where all they do is build apartments and we right. offer them a part of the ownership as, as part of the deal and they're building them for cost. So, you know, that, that helps too, right? So now we're partners with builders. Yeah, and they could participate in the upside. Yeah, and they've got the expertise to to get it done. Yeah, we kind of are at that point where we're seeing price per door. We're in San Antonio and going. Well, yeah, we're kind of approaching build cost on some of this stuff, right? You are. Yeah, yeah. So, and and San Antonio is a good stabilized market. Austin is too. Dallas is still sure. good. You know, it's interesting. The statistics are still saying that there are a hundred thousand new jobs coming to Dallas. It's crazy. And there's a housing shortage, but there's so many new stuff coming out of the ground and, and stuff still trading at pretty high prices that, you know, at some point the statistics becomes outdated <laughs> and reality right. sets in. And I just don't know where we are in that, you know? Yep. So yep. all the indicators now, still suggest good, healthy. So I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. Yeah, no, that's right. I mean, we'll, we'll see. There's always variables to play with. I mean, taxes and insurance are a headwind for all of us for sure, but you've got rates. I mean, gosh, we're recording this in March, 2020. I mean, rates yeah. are really at the floor incredibly yeah. at the low. So there's always something you're never going to win uh, all aspects at one time. There's always kind of a give and take, right? Yep. That's exactly right. Yeah. So we just got to figure out how to capitalize on the current market. We're still out there putting offers in on deals. Uh, you know, I would say that we've done very, very well for some of my investors over the past few years. I mean, I've sold sure. um, 4,000 apartments in wow. the last 18 to 24 months. Good time so, to sell. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I've been selling, selling, selling. Well, all those investors got all their money back. They're like, Glenn, we need to find another deal. Right. So they're sitting on the <laughs> sideline knocking on my door. And I'm like, look, you guys, I'm trying, but I mean, I'm not going to just put you into a deal. You know, the last return I gave you was 30%. <laughs> I'm not going to give you one that's one. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and I could win yep. that. You know, I could get a zero return or a two or three percent return. Sure. Yeah. You close, you can close but, deals if you want. I mean, yeah. Yeah. All People day are long. Doing that. Yeah. yeah, they are. They are. It's, it's interesting when we get beat out by 2 million bucks on a deal, yeah. scratching our heads going, well, knock yourself out, you know? Yeah. That's ho what I was hoping to make on the deal when I sold it, you know, and they're, paying, <laughs> yes. they're paying for that up front. So buying so. it all up front. Yep. Yeah. 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 So who knows in, in, in five years, maybe they look like a genius with population growth and compressed cap rates, but there's yeah, just yeah. some risk tolerance that we just yeah. don't have. Yeah. And everybody, you know, and I've, and I've put some deals together, Devin, that didn't go well. You know, that's kind of yep. one of the reasons I'm exiting with my old business partner is because, yep. you know, uh, he wanted to chase just an acquisition fee and a construction right. management fee and was underwriting to unrealistic stuff. And so, you know, we put together three or four deals that were not profitable. And yep. that was actually one of the reasons we decided to separate, you know, so mm -hmm as I just couldn't continue um, with that methodology and stay in business. So. Yep. Yep. It's yeah. You've got to have the, the return. There's kind of the, the primary metric and everything else has to come behind that. Right. Yeah. And that's what David and I are uh, pretty aligned. You know, he and I think very similarly when it comes to underwriting deals, we're somewhat conservative in this late hour and neither one of us are too pressed to have to go put a deal together. 
The ones we are yeah. putting together are going to be very profitable, especially in this market. So right. uh, when everybody else is kind of bleeding a little bit, we're going to be tooting our own because yep. we created the value through development rather than, you know, value add or, you know, um, renovating. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. I think we're kind of on the same track. Like, uh, yeah, we love multifamily value add, but, you know, we want to stay open to r- safe returns is really what we're in business for is safe, safe tax advantage returns. Yeah, multifamily has been great for that. But, you know, we've, we've done some land stuff, some development stuff along the same lines. We're like, hey, we're looking for the return first if it, and, and in real estate. And if it looks a little different than a 1985 multifamily deal with a value add component, we'd take a look at it, right? Yeah, uh, just because yeah. you've got to stay nimble with, uh, with changing market conditions, right? That's right. You know, the 230 units that we're getting ready to um, close, um, those are all kind of uh, early 80s product, I think, you know, yeah. and some of them are even late 70s, but they were owned by one person for the last 20 years. Outstanding. And that person yeah. hasn't done anything on the interiors and really hasn't even pushed the rents. Their occupancies are- wow. 95, 100% um, for years. And so they don't even want people to move. You know, and the guy right. owns them free and clear, so he doesn't care. He's not looking to try and maximize his value. Sure, yeah. He He's just wants- get a nice check to sale. Yeah, he just doesn't want to, he just doesn't want the turnover. He doesn't want to paint it. He doesn't want vacancy. He doesn't want to lease it. So we're like, that's a gold mine for us. I mean, absolutely. our skill and knowing the value of renovations and it's a great pocket, you know? Um, so- I don't know. We're still looking at those. Um, they're fewer and far in between, but the ones we do put out there and offering, it's going to make money. That's for sure. Yeah. 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 I love it. It's great to be in a position not to have to do a deal, just churn through the underwriting and the tours and the offers. And, and, uh, yeah. when the right one comes up, jump all over it. Right. Yeah. 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 Love it. Love it. Well, th- Glenn, this has been awesome sharing your story. I, I love it. I think we could extend this podcast out all day. I'd be happy <laughs> yeah. to talk shop <laughs> with you. Uh, if somebody listening wants to get the book, wants yeah. to connect with you, what's a, what's a good avenue for that? You know, that's a great question. Um, they could just type my name, Glenn C. Gonzalez, into Amazon. It'll take okay. you to Maintenance Man a Millionaire. Or you can just type in the name of the book, Maintenance Man a Millionaire. It's uh, available uh, on Kindle, but also a printed copy. Uh, I'll even sign their copy. Heck, if they want to meet up with me sometime, you know. Awesome, okay. um, My email is glenn with two N's at obsidiancapitalco.com. So, uh, and people can reach out to me that way. And I'd love to hear from them. And, you know, Devin, thank you so much. Uh, I love talking shop. I agree with you. We can sit here and talk about putting deals together for hours. So, we're like like deal junkies. You're a deal junkie and I'm a deal junkie. (laughs) 100%, man. 100%. Uh, I love it. Well, we'll link to that info in the show notes, Glenn. Okay. Thanks so much for jumping on. Um, You know, I encourage people listening to to reach out and get connected with Glenn and, and get in his universe. And we'll catch up soon, I'm sure. I'm sure. Thanks, Devin. All right. We'll see you. Take care. Okay. Bye. Thank you for listening to the DJE podcast. For more information, please go to djetexas.com.